Uh, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking to you here today. Uh, my name is Lord Hard Thrasher, owner of the Reddest Trousers in Gloucestershire, 156th in line to the throne, and winner of the 2021 Hottest Gammon, as voted for by the readers of Peasant Suppression Monthly. You, dear viewer, are here, I hope, to watch a video about the wonderfully bonkers F6 Lightning. But before we get to that, I have a few parish notices which I need to address. Uh, firstly, I will use the occasional naughty word, and this has sometimes caused audience members to run for the hill screaming. Assuming that you're made of sterner stuff, it might be nonetheless a good good idea to pop a pair of headphones on just because you don't know who else can hear. Secondly, and rather excitingly, I was actually offered a sponsorship for this video, and being the moral vacuum that I am, I would normally be delighted to shill for, well, basically anybody. Except... Uh, you may have heard that it is not a lot of fun at the moment in Ukraine due to a certain short, bald man in Moscow who reads his history books upside down and now thinks he has some kind of divine right to rule Europe. As a result of Mr. Putin's military penis extension, there are a lot of people living in environments which might reasonably be described as altogether too loud. Whether that's young combat troops on the front line, hairy-assed artillery operators setting off big guns, or medics trying to help wounded close to the front, or indeed civilians on the receiving end of some mad Iranian's mini V-bomber, there are a lot of loud bangs in Ukraine at the moment. Moment. If you've never been next to a firearm being discharged, it's hard to describe just how fucking loud and penetrating the sound is. Uh, if you'd like to try and simulate it, simply strap two large fireworks to the side of your head and set them off. Do not do this. As you can imagine, this sort of noise going off suddenly and repeatedly at random all day and all night is not good for your mental health, nor is it good for your hearing, and I'd like to ask for a little bit of help for some people to fix that. So I was recently contacted by the rather wonderful Anastasia Peskovova. As you may have seen her, she's known as Ukrainian Anna, and she's been on some minor media outlets such as CNN and ITV. Uh, she describes herself as, and I quote here, a person from Kharkiv just doing what I can to help the Russians kindly fuck off, which, you know, is doing herself a little bit of a disservice as she's actually been a massive advocate for her country. She's raised Ukraine's profile and she's raised money for a variety of important causes. Her latest wheeze, and indeed something that she's been doing for a while, is to try and get some money together to buy ear protection protection for as many people as possible. You can see some of her efforts on Twitter, including some of her friends firing very loud guns at deed at fucktards who are trying to enslave her country, kill and rape her friends, and destroy her way of life. If you would like to help her, I've put her PayPal link below. Uh, each set of EarPro is about 60 US dollars, or about 45 sterling. Um, I would love anybody that can to donate at any size, because all the money that we put forward to this will go straight into buying ear protection and absolutely nothing else. Uh, we might not be able to stop the invasion, but we can perhaps at least ensure as many people as possible are able to hear Putin's eventual speech when he finally packs up and goes home. Uh, talking of seriously loud things, we should probably return to the subject of today's video, namely the English Electric Lightning F6. And one final point before we start. Uh, Jenkins tells me that to show engagement, I should respond to viewer messages in a, quote, constructive and helpful fashion. All right, very good. I suppose he can give all the advice he likes. Uh, he points out that one or two valuable members of this community object to my pronunciation of the word nuclear. Now, we're going to be talking about Cold War fighters here, so the word is somewhat unavoidable. Apparently, for reasons which I do not understand, to the American ear, my pronunciation of nuclear sounds like, and I quote, a constipated hick from rural Alabama who can't read. Well, I should defend myself here and simply point out that the word nuclear comes from the compound Greek word, new meaning new, and clear meaning fuck off, I'm going to say it any old way I like. That's cleared up, let us begin. When I was a small boy, and indeed not so small a boy, all I wanted to do was to become a fighter pilot. It was an obsession that led me to make strange and unnatural choices for an avowedly heterosexual teenager. Whilst most of my mates were off attempting to dance with girls who were still taller than they were, I was reading books about flight dynamics and jet engine design. Later, as my friends were discovering just how hard it is to try and undo a bra one-handed when unsighted, I was considering the merits of bypass and reheat systems, variable geometry wings and HOTAS joysticks. The only centerfolds I was interested in were the ones in NATO major combat aircraft. Look at the silhouette on that one. Whoa. 
What I'm trying to say is that whilst I didn't have a girlfriend as such, I did have a first love and it was the English Electric Lightning F6, the final form of a design that went all the way back to 1958. Seriously, this thing was fucking amazing, but it was well old by the time I first saw it. It had started in 1949 as a glimmer in the eye of a bunch of slightly crazed British engineers working for English Electric, which was one of those bonkers post-war businesses that made everything from washing machines to nuclear reactors. Perhaps somewhat unsurprisingly, the board got bored of making fridge freezers and decided that what they really needed was their own Mark II capable fighter interceptor, so they built one. And this was just as well, because in 1955 the Air Ministry got wind of the fact that there was a new Soviet bomber out there, the Tu-22, which was reputed to be able to cruise it over Mark I and would enter service in 1962. They realised, along with all of the people in the RAF, that the Gloucester Javelin just wasn't going to do the job and something else was needed in a hurry. Due to some typically British political fucking about, which we'll come back to, the P-1B testbed that English Electric had been using to terrorise chunks of the British countryside for a few years was essentially right there and ready to go. So rather than mess about in 1958, they just put it into production as a frontline fighter without really looking at any of the basic design requirements. And there it stayed for the next 30 odd years. And then in 1984, a small boy saw one flying in an air show and fell head over heels in love for the first time. Now, I will grant you that it was the 1980s and my parents were somewhat distracted by interest rates running in the high 20%, but nonetheless, they probably should have spotted one or two things about my character at this stage. My obsession with this plane was not fucking normal. I wanted the books, I wanted the models, I wanted the posters, I wanted tickets for air shows which I couldn't get to just in case the lightning flew there, I wanted the pyjamas, I wanted the bedspread, I wanted... yeah, okay, so it's pretty obvious I wanted wasn't normal, I was on the spectrum somewhere. Whatever, I was in love, I did not care. Nothing lasts forever, least of all love, sadly. The Lightning eventually retired from frontline service in 1988, never to split the skies over Britain again. In her absence, I began to realise that perhaps all was not quite well with the Lightning, and maybe that there were other, better planes about. This thought was compounded by the outbreak of the Gulf War, when I discovered feelings for another plane, specifically the Tornado. But that is a whole other story for another day. In time, I came to have some rather confused feelings about this weird and wonderful aircraft, and all that's left now is a sort of pink and warm feeling about summers long ago when she flipped on her back and went into a vertical climb 20 feet off the end of the runway. Shortly thereafter, I discovered simultaneously both that it's really hard to become a pilot and that it isn't that hard to hold a conversation with a member of the opposite sex, and if you asked a lot of questions and listened carefully to the answers, the chances of a successful Fox 3 were pretty good. The RAF never had the easiest of relationships with the Lightning either. When they first took delivery of the P-1B testbed and forced it into service, they realised they had something quite special very quickly indeed. It is, after all, basically a tube with two jet engines stuffed one on top of the other, a nozzle at one end to suck air in, and two holes at the back from which exciting raw power emerges. The bit in between is not exactly spacious, and so everything is designed to reduce drag and increase speed. Mod cons? No, there are none of those. The pilot is only really grudgingly given room to sit down. There is some fuel in there somewhere, but really not very much, and we're going to talk about that at length. But this is a machine that was built from first principles to go unspeakably fast, and not a lot else. Like a 1950s race car, it makes no compromises for comfort, or safety, or even common sense. It's still fast by jet engine standards today. In the 1960s, it was insanely fast. The problem was that in 1957, just 12 months before it came into full-time production, Duncan Sandy released a defence white paper that basically said, fuck it, we'll launch nuclear-tipped anti-aircraft missiles at anything that comes too close, why do we even need fighters at all? And like, on the one hand, who doesn't like nuclear flak weapons, but on the other hand, my god, I assume Mr Sands hadn't realised we lived on a tiny island where prevailing winds would blow nuclear fallout back over our major cities. This put a bit of a hole in the Lightning's development plans, which meant even though it was going into production, there were still a lot of questions hanging around. The thing was, though, it could do remarkable things given the chance, and so it was still pushed forward into service. If cruising at 10,000 feet, it could zoom climb to be at 60,000 feet inside 60 seconds, having broken the sound barrier in a vertical climb en route. There are almost no aircraft that can do that today. From brakes off to 35,000 feet was two minutes, and once the pilot disengaged his afterburners, it could cruise comfortably at over Mach 1, something no aircraft were able to do at the time, and very few since. Eat your fucking heart out unless you're flying an F-22. It was faster and more manoeuvrable than both the F-1 Phantom and the MiG-23, and it could go higher than either, although I will grant you that the MiG-23 is probably the worst aircraft of the Cold War, so it's not an entirely fair comparison. The Lightning was renowned as a smooth and biddable flyer, even at very high speeds, due to the 60-degree sweep in the wings. 
it had more firsts than Sir Lewis Hamilton. First British aircraft to exceed the sound barrier in level flight. First British plane to go to Mach 2 in level flight. First true heads-up display in the world. First true hands-on throttle and stick design or HOTAS in the world. First airborne monopulse radar in the world. First inline tail in the world. I could go on and on and on for some time. As I say, I was a geek and this was the object of my desire for years. So. If this was the RAF's Wanderwaffen, as I'm so brilliantly trying to tell you, and it was so world-beating, you're probably wondering why no fucker actually bought them. Well, first of all, fuck you, they did buy them, okay? Loads of them. Well, I mean, sort of. The Saudis fucking love them. They had, like, well, they have 40-odd, and the Q80s, well, don't even talk to me about the Q80s. I mean, what can you say about the Q80s? Yeah, I loved them. Um, and they bought 12. Also, shut up. Those are export sales. I win, you lose. Suck that Boeing. Fuck you, Northrop. Screw you. No, no, I, I, I can't prod this out. <sighs> you see, there may have been one or two teeny, teeny, tiny problems with this aeronautical embodiment of the Wallace and Gromit theme tune. I mean, first of all, most obviously, the lightning was, well, how can I put this? It's minging to look at. In fact, in a field packed with shockingly ugly aircraft, it may be one of the ugliest things ever to take to the skies. Well, except for the fairy gannet, but that thing was so ugly we refused to let it fly over dry land and exiled it to the world's oceans. With a pot belly and a weird looking set of undercarriage, top loading fuel tanks, a face with a hole, a sideways butt, and two funny hanging off missile things, it's not an aircraft for which a thousand ships were launched. One of the key problems was that it had a ridiculously short range. No shorter than that. At full chat, it had about 15 minutes flying time. That's that's not good enough. Envisioned as a short-range interceptor to defend the V-bomber bases, the thinking went that all it needed to do was to go up, shoot down a bomber or two, and then it... Well, they told the crews that they could turn around, come and land, rearm and go up again, but the reality was that everybody knew that there wouldn't be a UK to return to. The later F-6 and F-3 could go a little bit further by putting these big old feed tanks on top of the wings, having a probe fitted, ooh, uh, misses, so that it could refuel mid-air. If you're wondering how the RAF got so good at refueling that they could fly a pair of Vulcan bombers 8,000 miles to and from the Falkland Islands in 1982 using a fleet of 24 tankers, this is why. With a lightning on the force, they got a lot of fucking practice. I mean, obviously if the pilot wanted to avoid the loud button and wanted to be a little bit more conservative about life, the plane would go further. Maybe if you pushed it really carefully and you were gentle and nothing broke, say 800 miles or so. That's still not good enough. That meant that the enemy had to be, let's say, within 400 miles of your base, and should they do anything irritating, like take evasive action of literally any kind, you would run out of fuel and crash into the sea. The design philosophy behind the lightning might best be described as post-traumatic shock in that it came from an era when losing a few dozen aircraft in an afternoon was considered pretty normal and attrition rates were acceptable. The great big black rubber sock at the top right hand side there, that is the way that you see the radar screen. You undo the clip at the top, you put your head almost physically inside the tube, and then you can see the radar. If you don't do this, you can't see the radar. If you do do this, you can't see where the enemy is. It's genius. So the decision was taken that all this namby-pamby stuff like fuel and pilot really left no room whatsoever for one or two other basic safety measures, like, for example, chaff or flares. It had neither of those in 1958, and it still didn't have them in 1988. If it had, for any bizarre reason, ever been deployed into West Germany during combat, it would have had the life expectancy of a chocolate biscuit in a blowtorch. All that would have happened is Ivan would have finished his morning vodka, switched on his radar system for his SAM anti-aircraft missile, and pilot officer Timmy would have been dead about 20 seconds later. Fortunately, as the lightning never got fitted with a radar lock warning light of any kind, Timmy was unlikely to know what was going wrong until his plane disintegrated around him, and therefore wouldn't have had time to use the flares or the chaff that he didn't have, so I suppose at least it was internally consistent. Aside from fuel and range and the complete lack of basic combat survival features, there were one or two other issues as well. As I mentioned earlier from the off, the RAF really didn't have a clue what they wanted to do with it really, especially after the whole let's use nukes not pilots things in the Sandy report. Fortunately, someone in the MOD who hadn't been at the leftover amphetamines from World War II realised that no, we are still going to need fighters and pilots, and so they pushed on with the air interceptor for a while longer. But even by the late 1960s, the Lightning was beginning to look a little bit dated despite upgrades to the F3 and F6 versions. The RAF had the Hunter and then the Buccaneer to do ground attack, so they didn't try and develop the aircraft into that role which was probably just as well given the Lightning's terrifyingly high stall speed. Of course, we were quite happy to let foreign chaps try and have a go at that sort of thing, so the export versions had things like rocket pods on them, which presumably also came with a wipe-clean pilot seat. They did deploy two squadrons of Lightnings to West Germany, but its woeful range always limited operations, and it was clear that by the mid-1970s, basically anything with wings would be preferable, hence the development of the terrible Tornado ADV from 1979, a fighter that really couldn't do fighter stuff at all, but at least it went a long way whilst not doing it. 
Added to the RAS problems was a sort of pig-headed bloody-mindedness which Brits are occasionally prone to. As late as 1987, lightning pilots were training to get into the bomber stream. My brothers in Christ, in 1987 there wasn't going to be a fucking bomber stream, just a lot of missiles flying around giving people 3D sunburn. Worse, had there been such a thing as a bomber stream, by that point it is highly unlikely that the lightning pilot would ever have been able to find it on account of the total lack of technology on the airframe. So we've established that it couldn't go very far, couldn't really see what it was supposed to be aiming at, the RAF didn't know how to use it, no one wanted to buy one. In short, it was the flying embodiment of 1970s Britain, theoretically jolly good but really living off fading glory. One thing you will note from basically all the images I've shown you are those two missiles. They look jolly impressive, jutting out purposefully like that. You will then be shocked to know that these two were semi-brilliant and semi-awful bits of British kit. Firestreak, the original missile, was a genuine marvel of British technology for 1951 in that it used an IR seeker to hunt down its quarry, which was second to none in the world. I say hunt down its quarry, but what I really mean is advance at speed in its general direction. Should the enemy do something irritating like, I don't know, turn, then Firestreak would continue majestically toward the horizon because it couldn't turn for shit. Also, it used various exciting chemicals which tended to kill the ground crew a lot, so it was wildly unpopular. The chances of actually hitting anything with it was next to zero. This was doubly a problem on the F3 Lightning when they took the guns off. Its replacement missile was a thing called Red Top, which on paper was a genuinely amazing weapon system for its time. It could take out targets from over 18 miles away, outranging the then current AIM-9 Sidewinder by some way, and also travelling a lot faster in the process. But this was British industry from the 1970s, so of course there was a massive fucking flaw. The new upgraded IR centre at the front didn't like wind, or clouds, or rain, or mixed conditions. I remind you that this is a missile designed to defend one of the dampest spots in the North Atlantic, where summer on sunny years can last just an afternoon. But let's give it the benefit of the doubt, let's assume you got your red top onto your target of choice and you splashed the next bad guy, your 13 minutes of fuel was still remaining, well then congratulations you've just expended 50% of your entire ordnance because this thing could only carry two missiles. Why not stick more under the wings? God, I'm so glad you asked. Well, I've talked about range quite a bit during this and mentioned that you can't put missiles under the wings and to explain both we need to talk about the undercarriage and not the fun pneumatic kind on human beings but actual undercarriage. So back in the day when they first came up with the Meteor, you know, the first actually operational fighter jet in the world. No, 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 that wasn't the MDE-262, despite what Wikipedia says. You want to fight over this? Okay, okay, fine, let's go. The first 262s were delivered to their squadrons in April 1944. That is not the same thing as being operational, and you can tell because their first claim wasn't made until the 8th of August, apparently on a Mosquito. Which is odd because if you look at the RAF records at the time, they don't show any mozzie losses on the 8th of August 1944. Actually, if you dig into this first confirmed kill business, it looks like it didn't really happen until November 1944, some eight months later. Which is a long fucking time if your plane is supposed to be operational and your sky is filled with crappy B-17s just begging to be blown away. It rather suggests that no, the ME-262 was not operational in April or anywhere fucking close. Compare that, if you will, with the Gloucester Meteor, which did become operational in July, and it got its first kill three weeks later. One of those is an accurate representation of a squadron coming up to speed with a novel aircraft, and the other is Nazi bullshit. Not the point. Sorry, where was I? Oh yes, uh, the undercarriage. The Meteor was a radical aircraft because for almost the first time you could have a fighter which taxied with a flat nose. This had been a huge problem with almost all propeller-powered fighters before. Generally fighters had to tilt their noses up towards the sky whilst doing ground stuff on account of the fucking great big disc of spinning death attached to the front. If you moved around in order to see what was in front you had to zigzag and woe betide you if you ran over the station commander's Labrador. The meteor got round this by having jet engines out on the wings and suddenly there was nothing to chew up the scenery in front of you so the whole thing could be flat which meant a nice tricycle undercarriage and provided that Fido stayed out of the way of your wing-mounted air suckers, all would be well. Good stuff. Except, they took the tricycle approach almost lock-stock and put it on the test platform for the supersonic jet. That then passed into the P-1B, which was then pushed into production in a hurry without anybody really stopping to check whether or not this was a good idea. The hitch here being that it is in completely the wrong place. The undercarriage folds into the wings, which is the only space where there's room for any fuel tanks on the Lightning. So suddenly, yes, you have this nice, stable taxiing characteristic, and you have this super-fast, low-drag airframe, but you also have almost no fuel and nowhere to put weapons. There was some logic here. RAF pilots called it the frightening. Most jets touch down at, let's say, 100 knots or so, some quite a lot less, some a little bit more. A Lightning needs to come into approach at 180 knots and land at 150 knots, bang on. That's damn near 200 
miles an hour. If you fucked it up, you weren't going to buff out the creases, hence the need for a nice wide undercarriage. So, it was a completely awesome aircraft in every way, except it couldn't really go very far, it didn't really have a roll, it couldn't really dogfight, you could only shoot twice and not that well, it had undercarriage in the wrong places, no one wanted to buy it, and it landed at a significant percentage of mark, otherwise it was flawless in every respect, and I for one will not have a bad word said against it. 